2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to read verse 21. The Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Brother Big Doug, why don't you pray for us this morning? Mm. Thank you, Brother Doug. Verse 21, I want to draw your attention as some things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the punishment Christ endured. Can I say it wasn't the torture of the cross, oh, that was great punishment. It wasn't the plaiting of the crown of thorns the stripes upon his back or the pulling out his beard that hurt him the most. The punishment that Christ endured to prove his love for you and I, we find, the Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Isaiah said that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The royal, righteous, regal, darling son of God the Lord of lords and King of kings. He who was holy, so holy, the seraphim cry above his throne, holy, holy, holy. He became your sin and my sin, took upon himself our filthy, vile sins when he hung on Calvary. He who knew no sin, became sin that you and I might not only become saved, uh, but become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. We see the punishment Christ endured. We see the perfection that Christ exhibited. It said, who knew no sin? He knew nothing about sin. He knew nothing about uh, the pull of sin or the tainting of sin. Uh, can I say he was holy, uh, uh, sin coming before his presence would eradicate a uh, 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 friend. Uh, he was more pure than we could even imagine. Uh, he knew no sin. He was perfection. He alone could fulfill the demands of God to become our Savior. We see the punishment that Christ endured, the perfection that Christ exhibited, but we also find the promise that Christ ensures that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Friend, you can do all the works that you can come up with and you'll never be righteous. Amen. You can give all the money that this world could ever print and you could not be righteous. You can pray all the prayers that you could muster up within yourself and you could never be righteous what makes us righteous we have to be in him my dear friends well, that night that I got born again uh, when I called upon the Lord in repentance and faith uh, he not only saved me uh, brother Bob uh, he not only sealed me with the Holy Spirit of promise, uh, but Brother James, he robed me in his righteousness. Uh, I have been made righteous uh, in Christ. Uh, when God looks at me, he doesn't see my flesh. Uh, he doesn't see my faults. Uh, he doesn't see my failures. Uh, he doesn't see my past. Uh, he sees Christ uh, and the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we ought to shout. Uh, we ought to run. Uh, we ought to be excited uh, over the fact uh, that I 
deserve to go to hell, uh, but I'm not going to hell uh, because Christ was made sin for me. Uh, that Christ who knew no sin uh, took my sin, uh, and because of that, uh, I could call on him, uh, and I got to put on his righteousness. What a blessing today uh, to be saved by the good grace of God. Uh, but I'm interested this morning in verse number 18. The Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, or by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I'm interested in that phrase this morning, and with God's help, for just a few minutes, I want to preach on the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Now, the definition of reconciliation is simply to change thoroughly. When God saved me, he didn't just change some of me. He changed me thoroughly. Now, can I say that part of me is still trying to catch up with the change? Because when God looks at me, he sees Christ. And can I say, in Christ, I'm perfect. But can I say, presently, I'm not perfect. But my presence is trying to catch up with my position in Christ, uh, and I'm trying my best to be all that I can be in him. But when Christ looks at me, he sees a thorough change. Yeah. And could I say that when you were reconciled to God, he changed you thoroughly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I say that the term reconciliation embodies this? It embodies regeneration. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, false Bibles say new creation. I'm the same guy I was before I got saved. Same flesh, same hair color, same eyeball color, same name, same person. I didn't become a new creation. I became a new creature. Mm. Uh, I'm the same guy, but something changed. What changed? Well, read on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things became new. When Christ saved me, he changed me. Things I used to love, I didn't love anymore. There were uh, uh, some words I used to love to say that I didn't like to say anymore. Uh, there were some thoughts uh, of uh, some places that I wanted to go in life that I, I didn't want those places anymore. Uh, there were some uh, actions uh, that I used to do that I didn't enjoy doing anymore. Uh, but some things I used to hate, all of a sudden I loved. Uh, I, I couldn't wait to get back to church. Uh, couldn't wait to hear preaching. I didn't like preaching before I got saved. Uh, couldn't wait to hear singing like this. Uh, I didn't like singing like this before I got saved. Uh, you see, he changed me. Uh, and when he changed me, he changed my desires. Hmm? See, reconciliation embodies the term regeneration, a new birth. Ah, a new birth comes through repentance and faith. If you're not saved, I highly recommend getting born again. Yeah. Nothing like it. Mm. Can I say it not only embodies regeneration, it also embodies the term removal. It removes something from me. Say, so what did it remove? It removed enmity. You see, before I got saved, I was dead in trespasses and sins. I was alive, but I was dead. I was dead to God. And it was more than that, uh, Brother Ron. I was at enmity uh, uh, against God. I was the enemy of God. My flesh was at enmity with God. God hated everything that I had become as a sinner. Uh, and God hated my sin and hated sin in my life. Uh, and that sin caused me to be the enemy of God. Uh, there was hostility between me and God. Not a good place to be. Uh, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. But when I got saved, that hostility, that enmity was removed. Even though God loved me before he saved me, 
I fell in love with God after I got saved uh, and realized and experienced the love of God uh, in so much uh, that I've just continually fallen in love with him. Hmm? You can't sing enough good songs about him. You can't preach enough about him. You can't talk enough about him. All it does is continually endear me to him. Why? Because enmity's been removed. Not only does reconciliation embody re regeneration and removal, but it also embodies this term, restores. Means to obtain the favor of. You see, Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day. But when Adam and Eve chose to sin, that was taken away. But can I say that when you and I got born again, it restored fellowship with God. Amen. Now, we don't physically walk with him, but I do walk with him. Amen. I don't physically hear his voice, but I do hear him. Huh? Say, so how can you hear him if you don't hear him? Oh, if you met him, you'd hear him as he speaks to your heart. Uh, how can you walk with him if you don't see him? Because he lives in me. And I walk with him. Huh? So I'm interested in this ministry of reconciliation because, again, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. See, we couldn't get to God until Jesus Christ came and made a way. Uh, thanks be unto God for the way of the cross. But then it goes on to say, uh, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Can I say in the ministry of reconciliation, there's a commission. Verse 18 says, he has given to us this ministry. What is the ministry? To reconcile people to God. That is our ministry today. If we're not getting people to God, we need to go out of business. Can I say, uh, uh, the church ought to be a lighthouse to the community. Ought to be a lighthouse for sinners to know they don't have to die and go to hell. They don't have to stay in their sin. Uh, there is a way out. Uh, God will break the chains of their sins. Uh, make new creatures out of them. Uh, sinners can be saved by the good grace of God. We ought to get sinners to Christ. But can I say, it's also to let folks know that have been saved, but maybe they're hurt. They get back to Christ. Maybe they're confused. Christ will solve their confusion. Get them to Christ. Amen. Maybe uh, 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 they've been done wrong. Get them to Christ. He'll do them right. Uh, it's all about getting folks to Christ. Reconciling folks to God. Hmm? Now I'd like to tell you that everywhere you go that's called a church, they're going to treat you right. You're going to hear about Jesus. You're going to get some help. But can I say some of the worst places I've ever been is in church. A lot of you know long before I was ever called to preach or really called into anything but a hothead I was a ball player and I'll never forget some folks joined my granddaddy's church and they wanted to have a softball team and my grandfather was dead set against it but my grandpa was getting up in years and I guess they just wore him down and finally said okay you can have a softball team well the guy that started all that you know he, he had the softball team and everything well uh uh I don't know, I was, I was in between games or something, they was practicing, I showed up and he saw me play, he said, why ain't you playing for us? I said, well, first of all, you didn't ask me. But second of all, softball was for sissies, man. <laughs> yeah. If I couldn't throw one about 93 high and tight up underneath some guy's chin, it wasn't, it wasn't ball, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, I decided, I said, okay, I'll come and I'll help you out, I'll play. So I went and helped them out. Went to play. And of course, I knew everybody on team. I grew up with most of them. But could I say some of the worst fights? Now, I, listen, I played where if somebody got knocked down by a baseball, benches cleared. I mean, all they told us is we had to leave the bats in the bat bins. I mean, there was fights all the time. But I'm here to tell you, Brother Bob, some of the worst fights I've ever seen was in church leagues. I'm not kidding you. Some of the worst 
language I heard from sidelines yelling at other players was from church leagues or little grandmas. So I've heard them in some of these uh, little leagues. Little grandmas can get rough, huh? But I'm just telling you, some of the worst places I've ever been offended was around people that called themselves church people. Huh? That ought not be. House of God ought to be a haven, ought to be an oasis, uh, ought to be a place where you can come get some help, uh, where you can see Jesus high and lifted up. Uh, but somewhere around, uh, around, I don't know, the last 25 years, all of a sudden, people got to think a church was about us. It's about Him. So we have a commission to reconcile people to Jesus. That's our job. Tell folks about Jesus. Point folks to Jesus. Compel them to come and hear about Jesus. So we see the commission of the ministry of reconciliation. We see the cause of the ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What is the cause of this ministry? You don't have to carry your sins anymore. Uh, God sent Christ uh, uh, to take your sin away. Uh, uh, your trespasses, your sins, uh, those things that haunt you and keep you from sleeping at night uh, can be washed away. Uh, you can be made new in Christ. Uh, the cause of this reconciliation is to get people out from under the load they're under. I don't know about you, but there's folks carrying heavy burden today. There's saved people carrying heavy burdens today. And we need to get them reconciled to God. Because he'll carry them and their burden. We not only see the commission and the cause, but notice the charge in verse 19. He says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Can I say God could write it in the sky, but he didn't choose that. He chose us to have the word of reconciliation. God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What will reconcile people to God? The word of God will. Uh, and when we put our faith in what God says, it will make a change in our lives. We've been begotten again by an incorruptible seed, the word of God. Uh, so the charge is for you and I yeah. to share the gospel with them, sure. to share the good news, uh, to share the promises of God, uh, uh, to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, uh, uh, to perform the word of God before yeah. people, Amen. to esteem others better than ourselves. Uh, uh, oh, so much to forgive others because God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven us. Uh, it's all about the ministry of reconciliation. There's the commission, the cause, the charge. Notice the caretaker of the ministry. Look at verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's dead, be ye reconciled to God. The caretaker of this ministry is us. We are all ambassadors for Christ. Now can I say, I just got back from the island of Grenada. I'm sure that somewhere on that island, there might have been an ambassador from the United States. If I'd have went into that embassy, it had been just like I was in the United States. You know, they couldn't touch me while I was there. That was sovereign ground. It was part of the USA. We have an embassy anywhere in the world. It's sovereign. And it's to be protected. And it's backed up and protected by the United States of America. I can find the help I need at any embassy throughout this world. Can I say that you and I are to be ambassadors and we're to provide a refuge. We're to let folks know uh, they can find help here. Uh, and friend, it's backed up by heaven uh, and heaven provides protection uh, and heaven provides supply uh, and heaven has all that they need uh, and you and I are the caretakers of this ministry. Amen. 
You know what happens when churches close? The ministry of reconciliation for that area is gone. See, this thing's a lot bigger than us. Amen, Pastor. Mm. We're the candlestick for this community. We're to be the ministry of reconciliation. We're to be a caretaker of the Bible. Why do you think everything that we do around here is based upon the Bible? Well, because we're a caretaker of it. Why do you think that we, we drove our kids seven and a half hours... All the way, although the way Brittany drove is nine hours to North Carolina to hear preaching and singing. Yeah. Amen. Because we're caretakers of this ministry. We wanted them to know that they can go other places and find young people just like them that love the same Jesus they love, that worships the same way they worship, that loves the Bible the same way they do. The Bible's preached the same there as it is here. What a blessing for them to see that. Because if the Lord don't come back, they'll become the caretakers of this ministry. We find the commitment to the ministry of reconciliation. Look in verse 11. The apostle says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. See, see friend, uh, I'd love to say that God loves everybody and everybody's going to heaven. Joe Olstein's made a lot of money doing that. Now, I will tell you this God does love everybody with an everlasting love. He loved everybody so much he sent his son to die for their specific sin. And if you'd been the only one that ever would have trusted him, he'd have still died for everybody. But I'm here to tell you, God doesn't let everybody into heaven. Matter of fact, whether or not you go to heaven isn't dependent on God, it's dependent on what you do with what God said. God made a way for you to go to heaven, but the choice is yours. That's right. yeah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You've got to put your faith and trust in the finished works of what Jesus did for you. But can I say this today? Jesus also said at the day of judgment, many would come to him and say, well, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? He said, depart from me, ye that, ne I ne depart from me, ye that I never knew thee. He said, uh, uh, and he cast them off in the lake of fire. Can I say the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels? But every man that rejects Christ and dies in his sin goes to the same place to pay for his own sins. Amen. Knowing the terror of the Lord, that God's serious about this stuff. Either you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved, or you'll die and go to hell. Amen. Jesus said, repent or perish. Right. And those who reject Jesus Christ are going to die and go to hell. Knowing that terror, we persuade men. We pray for them. We tell them. We bathe their soul in prayer. We plead with them. Don't die and go to hell. Do everything in our power to put Christ before them. And that's our commitment. I'll never forget, I hadn't been pastor here a month. I announced we was going to go out, start knocking on doors and leaving gospel tracks. I had a fellow tell me, so well, we did that one time. We passed out about 500 tracks and nobody came. I said, so? We're going to tell them again. Right. And again. Yeah. And again. Yeah. And again. And some 24 years later, we're still telling them. I said, what if they never get saved? Well, they'll never be able to say, well, nobody came by our door and told us there was a way out. Amen. We've got to be committed to it because God is. Then I thought about this. I thought about the carelessness of the ministry of reconciliation. Paul wrote back in chapter 4, verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that is lost. 
Friend, I believe Jesus is coming soon. We need to be busier than ever before about letting folks know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures, that Jesus made a way for them to be saved from their sin and they can be saved today. That is our ministry. It's a ministry of reconciliation. God help us to let people know Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. If you're here today and you're not saved, I've got good news, Jesus saves. You can be saved today. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. A moment, go and have an invitation. If you come, we'll take the Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. You can be saved the way God said to be saved. Uh, you can be saved. If you're here today and you're saved, what are you doing with your salvation? Say, so, preacher, why didn't you have one other preacher preach today? Oh, we've got a lot of great preachers here, and every one of them could have preached. But you know what? This is another opportunity for me to preach. Amen. Amen. Mm. Uh, can I say, I told Miss Nett yesterday, I said, enjoy June. I said, come July, I'm on the road. I'll be preaching more meetings this year than I think I've ever preached before. I said, why are you so busy, preacher? Because Jesus saves. Yeah. Jesus saves. Yeah. That's our ministry. Amen. About letting folks know about Jesus. Because nothing else really matters. A hundred years from now, the only thing that's going to matter is what we did with Jesus Christ. Amen. And what we did for Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Preach, I'm saved. Hallelujah. What are you doing for him? You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. You say, preach, I'm not a preacher. Yeah, but if he saved you, you're an ambassador. You can tell somebody. Uh, you can point somebody. You don't need to know the whole Bible. Just tell them how you got saved. Uh, I wonder today, what are we doing with the ministry of reconciliation? You know, I can't help but believe if the last hundred years churches would have been what they were supposed to be, we'd certainly look a lot different in America than we look. Huh? Huh? And if a bunch of Fruit Loops can take pride in the fact they're on their way to hell, then a bunch of saved folks ought to take pride in the fact that we're saved and going to heaven. And we ought not be ashamed to let people know. God help us to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. If you're here today and you're not saved, why don't you come? We'll get somebody to take a Bible show you how to be saved. If you're here today and you're saved, what are you doing with the ministry of reconciliation? What impact are you doing? They're making for Christ. As they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. Thank you for the word of God. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, forgive me where I've fallen short in the ministry of reconciliation. God, help us to always be reminded of the terror of the Lord. Now, Lord, I can't help but think in a crowd this size, there may be some that doesn't know Christ. I pray today would be their day of salvation. I pray they'd come. I pray the sweet Holy Spirit would draw them. They'd get born again. God, I pray for your people. Lord, some of the finest people I know in the world is in this building today. I pray, God, you'd give them a greater burden to make a greater impact for Christ than ever before. Bless now in this invitation. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.